Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It's Saturday, and we are going to study Torah together once again. And I just got back from the beach. I had a wonderful morning with my son, and we sat on some rocks by the water, and we talked about, oh, all kinds of things, politics, the church, Christians, the world. Um, but I always try to leave my kids with something profound that they remember from their mother. And so my question today was for my son is, who is your God and who do you follow? And I always say, remember, follow Jesus, because everybody else are just people, people. And when we just follow people, we can get off track. And so how do you stay on the highway, the straight highway? And that's one of the themes of our study today. So I want to get started. And for those of you who've not joined us before, this is the book we use. Uh, it's called A Year Through the Torah for Christians, and you can get it on Amazon. And we're about to start a new Torah cycle. What is a Torah cycle? Okay, so the Torah cycle is what the Jewish people read weekly, small portions of scripture through the five books of Moses. Now, why is that important? And why should Christians study the five books of Moses? Well, here's why. Because Jesus said, if you had believed Moses, you'd believe me because he spoke of me. And all the things that, that are taught in our uh, Old Testament, what we call Old Testament, is what Jesus taught when he came and walked on this earth. And so if you understand our Jewish roots and we understand the idioms and we understand the culture and the context of the Torah, then you'll understand and it'll become fuller in its meaning when you read the New Testament. And so that is uh, what we're doing. And we're in the book of Deuteronomy or Devarim in Hebrew. And we're going to get started by uh, saying a prayer that all Jewish people say together when they study Torah. And so I'm going to share my screen and we will get started today with the book of Devarim. And we're in chapter 7 through 11 today. And so let's say the prayer that is said prior to Hebrew study. And here it is in the blue. So let's say it together. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Asher kirishano be mitzvotav, vitzevano la asok be devre Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with his commandments and commands us to busy ourselves or be immersed or dive in to the words of his Torah. Amen. So let's get started. We're in the parasha or the portion of Deuteronomy that's called. Akev. Akev means to follow. It also means or because of. So when something happens, something follows. And so this is Moses speaking to the children of Israel prior to them going into the promised land. And he's giving them kind of like the fatherly final last words. And so let's look at this uh, title Ikov. Ikov is the same name for Jacob. It's the same root word. Yaakov means to follow or because of, and sometimes it's translated as a heel because Jacob was holding the heel of Esau when he was born, and that's how he got named. But he followed after the twin brother. So he was born second. And it's interesting, as you go through this portion, you'll see what it means to be born second or to be on the heels of someone else. Now, it also, in a negative sense, means to act deviously because if you're overtaking somebody, you're on their heels, that means sometimes that's negative. So they're following to bring them down, perhaps. So it can be positive or negative. It can mean to overtake, or to reward as an end result of something, there can be a reward. So see, it can be positive or negative. But the common theme is what happens following something else or what happens afterwards. So that's what this um, portion is called. And um, if you notice that Jacob had his name changed, he had a moment in his life 
when everything changed, he was even given a new name. And I think it's important to say up front before we get into this study what the new name was. The new name that he was given was Israel or Israel. So when you hear the name Jacob to follow, it also is the word for the whole nation of Israel. And look at what Israel's name is made up of. Two words, Yashar, Yisrael. El is God, and Yashar means to go straight. And um, it's interesting that to go straight is a name for another book called the book of Jasher or Yashar, and I wanted to show you that. It's the ancient book of what they call Jasher, and it's referenced in our scriptures in Joshua, 2 Samuel, and also 2 Timothy. So it's the book of Yasher or Jasher, and it has facts in um, it about the books of Moses. And so it's a fascinating ancient book, and uh, you can get it and read in more detail uh, some of the things that we read in our Old Testament. So I just wanted to show you that. I do have this book, and I've been reading it and find it fascinating. And it's a well-respected book among the Jewish people. So um, back to Yashar, which is the name of Israel, means go straight, and it means God-given straightness. So with that in mind, we are um, going to begin this book. Now, it's important to also talk about a straight way. And what does that mean to go straight? Because this book is about Moses telling his children, Israel, how to go straight and how to stay on the path, following the one true God. And so I'm giving you this background because I think it's important to see the final heart of Moses to Israel and see that he wants them to go on the highway. And if you look at Isaiah 40, verse 3, um, it talks about make straight a highway. So I want to talk about this first, Isaiah 43, before we start this study. This is what 40, verse 3 and onward says, speak tenderly, to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her forced labor has been completed. Her guilt has been paid for, for she has been received from the hand of God a double for all her sin. And you're like, what? What does that mean to receive double for her sin? Well, that, I, I showed you all these Hebrew words, and you can look at this on your own. But when it says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem, that word tenderly is translated, speak to the heart of Jerusalem, or God's people. And so this is a way for the prophet Isaiah to say, speak to the heart. And so when I was with my son this morning, it's like God said, speak to his heart and tell him what it means to follow a highway or a straight path. And so I studied the word highway this week. Isn't that crazy? Did you know why a road is called a highway? Well, a highway got its name from the Roman roads. And they would raise up a road and it had it was higher than the, the ground around it. And it was so people could travel on it and see it and see that it was flat. And this is the way to go. It's raised up and it's without hindrance. And that's where you get the word for highway. It's a higher way to travel. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that is so much like the Christian walk. That's why it says make straight a highway. So that's what Moses is telling the children of Israel, the very same thing. He's saying, speak tenderly or to the heart of my people and say that you've received a double portion for your sin. In other words, you've done all these mistakes in your past, but if you're coupling or if you've um, received double, 
that word double is kapal, and it means a coupling. So in other words, when you make mistakes, if you couple yourself with God, you will be on a straight highway and your your the road will be level and you'll be able to travel on it easily so i'm springboarding from this about the heart and about um isaiah 40 because basically he's saying israel you've been married to god and if you stay coupled with him you'll be on a straight highway that's what isaiah 40 is all about and so um, i did a little personal study on that and i wanted to show you that before we get started israel's name means to go straight and to be on a highway a highway coupled with god and so let's begin there so moses is saying to the children now because you listen and keep his word god will keep you that's basically the message. Hear and guard what God says. And that's exactly what I told my son today. God's ways are higher than man's ways. It's his way. You know, you've heard of my way or the highway. Well, his way is the highway. Oh my goodness, that is such a profound thing. So look, the words for hear and guard have the word shem or name in it. See right here? The shin and the mem is the word for name. So it's like God's name is in the two words for hear and guard. In other words, guard and protect what God is saying. I love that. So I love that in a way it's like his name is in those two things, to hear, guard, and protect, and watch. See, it's also the word for a watch in the night. Shamar, when you guard something, you're watching over it. See, that's what God does for us. He watches over us, just like a parent would watch over their children. God watches over us. And so that's what Moses is saying to Israel right before they're going to go in and face some enemies. And he's saying, watch over it, guard it, and hear it, and listen to it, and follow it. So that's basically what this is all about, following God's ways. Now, following God's ways and obeying his words are called a mitzvah or a good work in Hebrew. And it's called a mitzvot in plural. So in Judaism, the one who follows and guards and obeys is the one who gets the reward. And it's called the one who completes the work and the work is a mitzvah. And so look, we see this in Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you, a mitzvah, will be faithful to complete it. And then there's a reward. So see, God begins the work in us, and we reap a reward for following him. See, that is so beautiful. So look at Isaiah 40, verse 10. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work is before him. So in other words, God gives us his word, his ways, in order for us to work them out in this world. You see, it's not about just going to heaven. It's about bringing heaven down, and then us doing the work, coupling with God. This is a beautiful concept in Judaism, and we see it in the New Testament too. So look, I wanted to show you something. Um, there's a principle about the, the number seven in Hebrew. Number seven is also the word sheva. Sheva means seven, or um, the seven spirits of God. And it's talked about in Isaiah 11, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, the spirit of God, power, knowledge, and reverence, or the fear of the Lord. So this is also talking about the righteous branch in the same scripture of Isaiah 11. So I wanted to show you this pattern of seven because the Jewish people are about to enter the promised land and God's talking about the blessings that he wants to give them if they follow 
And then if they don't follow, there will be curses or consequences. And so I wanted to show you that pattern of the seven branches of a menorah is the word uh, Sheba, which means a promise or an oath. So isn't that interesting? When you have a completeness, there's an oath or a promise there. And so if you don't know this pattern of seven, you won't understand fully what Moses is trying to say to his people. So Moses names the new land, and he says, if you obey and follow, there'll be seven things that God will give you. And he lists seven fruits. Now, there's not a coincidence that he lists in, in Deuteronomy 8.8, 8, these seven fruits, because they're symbolic of the fruitful life that God wants to give his people. Now look, he says, there'll be olive and wheat and barley and fig and pomegranate and date honey and grapes. They'll be coming into the land then also of seven enemies, and these are the Canaanite nations. And so it's interesting that he's saying, follow me because you're gonna be fruitful. If you don't follow me and you follow the gods of the Canaanites, the seven enemies in the promised land, he talks about these as they're going to lead you off the straight way. And you'll be doing their pagan practices if you follow their gods, gods made of stone and wood that cannot, cannot interact with you. See, the pagan gods could not interact. There was no relationship. They just bowed down to them, but they had no relationship. They couldn't speak, they were blind, they were deaf, they were dumb, they were dead. Deaf, dumb, and dead. And so he's saying, don't follow them. Follow the God who's alive and has a relationship and an interaction with his people. So here's the seven enemies that God warns about in Proverbs, and it's in Proverbs 6, 17 through 19. And he's saying, there's seven blessings, there's, there's an oath that will come, and you'll bring fruitfulness if you follow the God of Israel. But if not, look at what he talks about, the seven spirits that are attached to these pagan nations. Now, you have to understand this. This is so important. There's, this, there's a lamp that's seven lampstands of Israel, and then there's the wicked lamp. And the wicked lamp also has seven spirits attached to it. Look what they are. And then look around you today. I was telling my son about this this morning. Here's the lamp, or, or what I would call the wicked lamp. And it's got seven things that are anti-God or anti-Messiah. Here's what they are. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a wickedness in the heart, feet that are quick to run to evil, and the last one is a false witness or someone who doesn't hold truth. And it ends with the seventh thing on that seventh lamp, the seventh thing being an end result being it separates brothers. Wow. So look, this is meant to be the seven fruits of promise. In other words, following God's ways, there's blessings. And it's, again, seven. Now, seven means completeness or wholeness. Everyone knows this in scripture. Number seven is completeness. Remember when God created the world and when he was done on the seventh day, he said it is good. It means it's complete. It lacks nothing. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. And so there's an anti-spirit that causes division. And we see that in the world today. And so they're about to go in to this land that's supposed to be a land of promise, but he's saying there's gonna be seven nations that are pagan and they're gonna to wanna to bring you down. They're gonna, they're anti-God. They worship things that are dead, that have no meaning. They're pagan, they're, they lead you to pagan practices. And that's what was going on. So God is saying, 
you're going to have to subdue these things, that spirit, when you come into the promised land. And you're going to have to fight for it. And so he's saying, I'm going before you and I'm going to help you fight against this pagan uh, people. And so God completed his work when he brought them out by releasing them from the bondage of Egypt. And he's saying, if you will follow me, I led you out in love. And because I loved you, I brought you out and freed you from slavery. So this bondage of the anti-God spirit wants to hold people in bondage. And that bondage can be many things in our world today. Addictions, um, bad attitudes, hatefulness, uh, the bondage of addictions, um, sexual perversion. All of these things end up leading us away from God and to things that, that don't bring us life, but ultimately death. So Moses is trying to give them a, a complete picture of where they are going and what can happen uh, either way, blessings or curses. And so he's saying, complete the work, family. Don't go halfway. I always say, don't swallow the ox and choke on the tail. He's saying, complete your race, because there is power when God's spirit is with you. And so I told that to my son today. I said, you can do it in the world's power. You can follow all the other voices, or you can follow the God of Israel that will lead you to a place of promise and a place of fruitfulness. Look at Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's workmanship. See, he started the good mitzvah in us through his spirit. Created in Christ the Messiah. Why? To do good work that God prepared in advance for us to do. That we should walk it out. Walk on that highway. Walk it out in the power of his spirit and in his promises. And so that's what we attempt to do to the very best that we can. So Deuteronomy 7.7, 7, Moses reminds them that Israel was the least of the nations, okay? He put his spirit in front of these people and led them out. And then he said, I'm going to give you my spirit and it'll be in you. And it's going to actually be not just a circumcision of the flesh, but it's going to be a circumcision of the heart. So again, like Isaiah 40 says, I'm going to give you a new heart and I'm going to circumcise your heart and I'm going to speak tenderly, tenderly to you and guide you. So he chose them because he loved them and he swore an oath or a promise. Here it is. Sheba, an oath. And they say an oath is to seven yourself. It's an idiom. So if they obeyed, God would extend his grace to those who love them. And so this word grace is chanan. Look, chanan, grace. What is so beautiful about this word is it's, it's related to the word for Canaan. You see, chanan, chanan, they're cognate words. The word Canaan as a verb means to establish a beginning, to strengthen or guide you. Oh my goodness, he was taking these people to a place that he was promising them it was going to be to establish a new beginning for them and to strengthen them so that he could walk out God's ways. Thank you to the Jewish people. Thank you to those who faithfully walked out the Torah so that when Jesus stepped onto the scene, everything he said was to establish the Torah in the flesh. Here was the Torah, Jesus, the Messiah, standing right in front of them. And he was doing all the things that they didn't have the power to do in the flesh. And he said, if you follow me, when I leave, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit 
to be inside of you. And it's going to circumcise your heart. And because I have a new heart, I'm going to have a new mind. And in my new mind, I'm going to have a renewing of my thinking, my stinking thinking. And I'm going to walk in his ways and walk in his will and walk in his words. You see, that's the transformation. That's the regening. That's the regeneration of the heart that's talked about in Titus 3, 5. He saved us not by righteous works, by trying to be good, but he saved us by grace, giving us a circumcision of the heart. And that's why he said, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her hard labor is over. The Messiah has stepped on the scene and has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. He took the curse of the law. The curse that said, if you don't follow it perfectly, there's death and curses. And so he took on the curse so that we could then walk in freedom from the curse. Freedom from sin and freedom from death. Not perfectly walking, but, but declared righteous in God's sight. And then to the best of our ability, we walk it out. And we try to tell others about Jesus and the beautiful life that he lived and what he did for us at Calvary. Oh my goodness, Lord, that is our mission. That is our mission statement, to tell the world about this Messiah, the one who came and perfectly lived a sinless life in order for us to be declared righteous and then walk it out the best we can until he returns. So look at that relationship between grace and the land of promise, which was Canaan. So moving on, God said that he would lay these diseases and disasters upon the enemies if they don't follow him. So he said, don't fear them. He said, what I'm gonna warn you against is your own pride. See, pride says, I want to do it my way. And he says, don't say that I'm doing all this because you're so wonderful. <laughs> he said, no, I didn't pick you because you're such a, a great people. I picked you so that you were actually the smallest. I picked you, picked you because I want my name to be great. And I want you to, to share the God of Israel and what he can do in his power uh, with the world. So see, he said, I'm going to use you, Israel, to share the God of Israel with the pagan nations. If they won't listen, then I'm going to send diseases and disasters. Wow, aren't we seeing that today? See, we wanted the God of Israel, the God of Christianity to be wiped out. And people want to do things their own way. And now the whole world is suffering. We don't want God. We don't want him in our schools. We don't want him in our politics. We don't want him anywhere. And what is going on today is exactly what was going on in those pagan nations when God tried to bring his ways to the people of the promised land, the Canaanites, those who were murdering babies, throwing them in the fire, dancing around, um, bringing prostitutes into their temples with their gods and following gods that were dead, made of stone and wood. And he's trying to say, I, I want a relationship with you. I'm, I'm alive. Jesus is alive and he's seated at the right hand of the father. And he's saying, I pray for you now that you too would know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he would use Israel to be that standard so that people would come to know him. And he said, but these nations that are in front of you are stronger and mightier than you, but I'm going to go in and I'm going to fight for you. So how do we fight? We fight through prayer. That's how we fight. We fight by calling on the name of the one who's stronger and mightier than anyone that we're facing today. And so that's how we fight, not in pride and not in self-seeking um, wills. So 
Moses then proved his point and listed all the mistakes of those who tried to do it their way in the past. He's reminding the next generation, look, when you try to do it your way, it doesn't work out so well. Let's, re let's remind this new generation what happened when they didn't want to follow God in his ways. He says, what about the sin of the rejection of, of the people? When, when God wanted that relationship with them at Sinai, they rejected him and they backed away. And they sent Moses up the mountain. God was trying to have a relationship with them then. And then the infidelity of the golden calf. How about when they started grumbling? They weren't happy with their manna. And they said, we want meat instead. They weren't grateful for what God had done. And then the waters of Meribah, when they complained, and they said, we don't have water. We're not going to trust you anymore. And they wanted to rebel against Moses. And he said, remember that? Remember that didn't turn out so well? And he said, what about the sin of the spies, their unbelief, and Korah's rebellion, and the seduction by the Moabite women, and they got the Israelite men off track. And he, and he said, how about the distrust of me to bring you into the promised land? And they had a rebellion against Moses and Aaron. And so over and over, what it came down to is who do you trust? Who are you going to trust for your future? That's the question. It's the question God asked me. It's the question that God asked Moses and all the people of our past, all our patriarchs and founding fathers of our faith. Who are you going to trust? Sometimes they actually didn't see what they longed for. And they had to die without ever seeing it. But just because they had this amazing history that they chose to keep on believing. And this is what Moses is trying to get across to now this new generation. And God said, he's going to drive out your enemies. He says, look, remember the past. Learn from your past mistakes and learn from the mistakes of others. Listen what John Maxwell said. It's said that a wise person learns from his mistakes. A wiser one learns from others' mistakes. But the wisest person of all learns from others' successes. So the ones that follow, the ones that believe, the ones that trust, the one, the word, uh, the words of God and, and learn to live the law of love. See, love conquers everything. The law of love says you're important. The law of love says I am your servant. How can I serve you? How can I lift you up? How can I love you better? How do you love your neighbor as yourself? That's the question. And so God still had a plan for this new generation. And look, the next generation, look at Korah. Korah was the, the, the uh, group of people that were swallowed up when they uh, led a rebellion. But look, not all of Korah's children uh, were following the rebellion because some survived. And look, this was written, Psalm 85, by the sons of Korak. See, th there's always a remnant in a generation that continues to follow, rightly, the God of Israel. And look, the children of Korak uh, wrote Psalm 85. <sighs> and they said, show us your unfailing love and salvation. The Lord will give what is good, and the land will yield its fruitfulness. So see, they're saying, I, I believe this God. I'm not like my fathers. I believe that there's fruitfulness when I follow this God of Israel. And it says faithfulness and love will meet, and righteousness and peace will kiss. And it shows that the God who is faithful and righteous will bring love and peace to the earth. You see, this is bringing heaven down. And that's what they called the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. And they said, Jesus, Yeshua, 
what is the greatest commandments? And what did he say? Love God and love others as yourself. So the Prince of Peace came to bring a new law and he brought it even closer, which was to the heart. And he said, it's not about following rules, people. It's about the law of love that says, I love God, I love his ways, I wanna follow him, and now I love others. You see, that's it. That's the unfailing love of God. So he reminds them of the many times that he came and interceded for them. And he said, I was willing to fast for you and intercede for you two different times. Remember Jesus when he was fasting for those 40 days, Satan came to him and tempted him with the things of this earth. And Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by what? the word of God, all that comes from God's mouth. See, Satan was looking at the physical and trying to tempt God. But Jesus said, hey, I'm not out here just fasting physically. I'm feasting spiritually. I'm feasting on everything my father is telling me. And that gives me my strength. That gives me my food. That satisfies my thirst. Oh my goodness. Satan thought he was fasting, but he was actually feasting. Isn't that beautiful? So store up God's words, and that gives us our daily food and gives us the living water. So he said, or your name will be blotted out from under heaven. Now this is a Hebrew idiom. And what does it mean to have your name blotted out? It means to have it erased. In ancient times, what they would do is when they wrote on parchment or scrolls, if they wanted something blotted out, they would soak it with water. And it would mean that they would dissolve the ink and then their name would be erased. So they considered this the darkest curse to have your name blotted out in God's book. Isn't that amazing? So he said he fasted out there so that their names wouldn't be blotted out. So just as Moses interceded for the children of Israel on top of that mountain, unseen, away from the people, that's exactly where Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God, interceding for us. He's praying to the Father for that remnant that will remain faithful, even in this generation and the one to come. So uh, Moses was a type of Messiah. And so in Judaism, when someone says either the name like Hitler or Haman, remember uh, Esther, and how uh, Haman wanted to wipe out all the Jewish people. Um, what, what they say in Hebrew is when they say, uh, may their name be blotted out, they say, yamak shemo vezicho. And what it means is may his name and memory be blotted out. Now look, they use that saying when they're referring to like Hitler or Haman. Now the rabbis say, they take the first letters of this saying and they say it's these three letters, Yasha, Yeshu, see that? And they use it for Yeshua. So the rabbis, when you say now the name of Jesus, you'll see in Israel, some of the women, when uh, the name Jesus was spoken over in Israel, they spit on the ground. Because they say that under the guise of Christianity, that many people were uh, persecuted and um, burned in synagogues as the crusaders marched around their temple with the crosses on their shields. So Jesus, to many Jewish people, is like a, a curse word, like as bad as Hitler or Haman. And they say, Yamak Shemo Vezicho, which means may this memory be blotted out. And now they say the same thing about Yeshua. 
but little do many of them know that they're talking about their Messiah. And one day they will look on the one that they pierced. That's what it says in the prophets, um, that they will look on the one they have pierced and they will mourn, they will grieve. They'll say, oh my goodness, what have we done? What did we do when we didn't believe in his name? Wow, that's sobering. And that's why we share the good news of the Messiah with the Jewish people. So it says in this portion of um, Deuteronomy that circumcise your heart. So just as they had a physical circumcision, which was the circumcision of the flesh, here in Deuteronomy, he's saying circumcise your heart, meaning unveil the source of life. Now, this unveiling is like removing the foreskin on the male, is like revealing the source of the seed or new life. Do you ever think about that? Circumcision is, is a removal of that skin that restricts the source of the seed or new life. And so spiritually, when you have an unveiling or a, a, a circumcision of the heart, you're, rem you're removing the veil spiritually that, that keeps you from seeing the revelation of the Messiah, the revelation of the source or your hope of new life. And that's Yeshua, Jesus. So even Rabbi Shaul, Paul, states in Romans 2.28, a true Jew is one who is circumcised inwardly by the Ruach, the spirit, and is of the heart. You see, Rabbi Shaul, Paul, he's referring back to Deuteronomy, to this portion of the Torah that's talking about removing that unbelief so that you can see the source of your hope for new life, the power over sin and death which is only found in the Messiah. And when we believe that he is the source, then we receive the spirit and he's free to give us on a just basis, his Holy Spirit, because he declares us then holy. You see, he can have a relationship now out of holiness because that sin barrier has been removed. What a beautiful, Beautiful picture. It's interesting. If you quote uh, uh, Maimonides, uh, which was a uh, Hebrew from the uh, 11th, 12th uh, century, uh, one of the greatest Jewish philosophers in the medieval period. And it's quoted in the Mishnah Torah, his 14 volume of the, um, it's like a commentary of the Torah. Um, he was one of the leading rabbis in the 1100s and 1200s. But look at what he said. The removal of the foreskin in circumcision is like removing coveting and lust. Now that's interesting because when we covet and lust something, it's our pride that says, I want more. I want, I want something for myself. That's pride. And so what's interesting is that that coveting and that lusting actually restricts God's intention to give us his holiness. And it, it keeps us from our pride, you see, because Jesus' teaching said, I didn't come to, to conquer. I came to serve in a loving way. That's why they called him God's servant. You see, he came to serve through love. And so he didn't come in pride. He, came, he didn't come on a stallion, on a great white horse. He didn't come with trumpets. He came in humility. And that's the savior. He came to serve others and out of a heart of love and humility. And that's what we're to be. He came to serve others, to die in our place. 
what a serpent. So Deuteronomy 7, 16, when they said, when you get into this promised land, you're to utterly destroy this people. And I'm going to hand over to you this people. And I want you to destroy them completely. Now, the reason was, is because of all the stuff they were doing, they were full of not only pagan practices um, that would ultimately bring down what God was trying to do, but we're talking disease, disaster, destruction. And he's saying, I want you to consume them. Don't take any pity. He said, or they're going to be a snare and a trap. So he was going in to wipe out what was going on there so that he could begin again. It was like a spiritual attempt to start over. And so he's saying, don't, um, don't let any of them live. He's saying, go in and destroy them completely because I want to start over a group of righteous people that would live before the God of Israel in a just loving, beautiful, righteous way. And so he was saying, I'm going to give the land to you, but first I want all of that gone. And so um, this is what was happening. It was God's attempt to start over. You see, they had swallowed the lie. They had swallowed the lie that says, don't do it God's way. Uh, you're, God's keeping something from you. Well, does this remind you of the garden? They swallowed that same lie, and it was the lie of pride. You see, you, you can do it without God. It, as a matter of fact, the more you try, the more you're going to become more and more enlightened, and pretty soon you too can be like God. You can have your own nirvana, your own righteousness. And yet, why is it again and again, man just keeps defaulting to the old nature? The old nature says, I want it my way. I want to I wanna do whatever my flesh wants. Didn't turn out so well for the pagan nations in Canaan, and God was trying to start over with his people. So Moses, tell, Moses tells them that God brought them there, to humble them, to see what was in their heart, and if they would really be hungry for him or hungry for their own ways. And so he said, I fed you every day with the things from my mouth. See, he had to speak the manna into existence. No one had ever seen manna. It was bread falling from heaven. But it came from the mouth of God. He had to speak that into existence. You see, it was the bread of heaven that was coming from the mouth of God. Oh my goodness. It was a picture of God's words and his ways and his will. But would they follow? Would they receive the blessing? Would they be fruitful? Would they be able to multiply in the midst of these pagan people? And he said, I want to give you streams of water, springs, water, fruitfulness. But he says, man does not live by just these things, but by everything that comes from my mouth. That's what he's trying to show them. In the physical, he's saying, if you'll listen to me, I will bless you. And the people and the nations that listened to God and that did God's ways had blessing. Those that didn't, famine, disease, pestilence, pagan practices, death, destruction. Yeshua was trying to show the world a better way. Blessed are those who what? Hunger and thirst after righteousness, God's ways. They shall be filled. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6. Whoever believes in me, the living Torah, Yeshua, rivers of living water will actually flow from deep within you. So it's this well of salvation springing up, feeding and giving water to others, serving in love others. That's the law of love. And so we can't do it on our own. We default to the old nature.
but with God's spirit in us, then rivers of water. See, that's the people related to that. They were hungry. They were thirsty in the desert. And God provided both hunger with the bread from heaven and water from the rock. And he's still doing it today. He, he also uh, says the same thing in, through the prophet Amos in Amos 8.11. He said, a time is coming where I will send famine over the land, but not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but on what? Hearing the words of Adonai. He says, I'm sending in the last days a famine, but not of water and not of bread, but of God's word. And that's exactly what we're seeing today. Exactly what we're seeing today. So God said, I'll drive out this pagan nations little by little, because I don't want the wild animals to overtake you. But he says, I'm going to be bringing you there and you're going to have to fight and you're going to have to trust me, but I'm going to bring you in. And it's, it's a process, just like our, our, our maturity spiritually is a process. But he said, don't, don't do it without me. Let me lead and let me have my exact timing of everything. See, truth plus timing is the maturing process of us spiritually. So I always say truth and timing walk hand in hand. So you might have the truth, but it might not be the right time. I always say God sent the right man at the right moment with the right method and the right message. Let me say that again. God sent the right man at the right moment with the right method and the right message. When all four of those come together, then there's fruitfulness. And it came with Yeshua when Jesus walked the earth. And he's coming again. So it's a process. It's a strengthening. Our courage and confidence is in him, and it's in his law of love. And he says, everywhere you set your foot, he said, I'll give you fruitfulness. But you need to be responsible, and you need to be ready. So the new challenge is, are we as Christians? responsible for the truth that we have and are we ready to share it and in a loving way with the world that's why we're here that's our mission so he said if you do this there'll be blessings but if you don't there'll be curses if you love and obey then i'll give you water in the right season you'll eat and be satisfied and you'll have all you need but if you're seduced and turn aside, then you'll have no rain, you will not be fruitful, and you will be exiled. Throw out God, you throw out the good. Lord, come, 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 come back and use us, Lord, while we're all waiting. So let's swing into the now the New Testament and see what it has to say that connects to this message today. And we'll go here to Hebrews 11, 8 through 13. It talks about how Moses uh, trusted God all the way to the end. And then Hebrews talks about our patriarchs, how Abraham had to trust and obey. Even though he didn't know where he was going, he had to trust God. And it says, by trusting, he received power. To live a new life. And they kept on trusting. Some died without ever seeing the promise, just like Moses. But they recognized that it was all just temporary here. But they had to be faithful. All of our forefathers were looking forward to a permanent home, not made with human hands, but by God. So we are being called today to remain faithful. And then look, we'll end Romans 8, 31. Paraphrase says, if God gave us his son, Yeshua, Jesus, and he didn't withhold him, how will he not also give us all other things that we need? 
So nothing can separate us from God. Those who love him are led by him and fed by him. And so greatness is a road leading towards the unknown. We don't know what's going on tomorrow, do we? But we know who holds our future. So let me ask you, what do you need? What are you trusting in? Who are you following? Trust takes years to build, and that was the process that God was taking Israel through. It was a process of learning to trust God. It takes seconds to break trust and forever to repair trust. So who have you been trusting in? Who are you following? What do you need for your future? We're to look back, remember God's care for us, and then also remember that in his care for us in our past, he will also be there with us in our future. So I leave you with two questions. Who are you following? And what do you need to trust him for, for your future? I trust him for my future. I hope you can trust him in yours. And I pray that if you don't know Jesus, that you will ask him into your life, ask him to forgive you for your sin, to fill you with his Holy Spirit, give you new eyes, new heart, new mind to understand and to know him intimately, and then help him, ask him to help you learn to love others as he has loved you and he served you by dying in your place. And then he offers you the gift of salvation. Salvation is a free gift. We can't earn it and we don't deserve it, but he offers it to all who would believe in him that he came and lived that perfect life and he died to give you new life. Trust him today as you did in your past, but also for your future. So God bless you. I love you. I miss all my Torah students, but God willing, perhaps in this new cycle starting in October, we can then meet again on Saturdays, either perhaps live or uh, as a group on Zoom, whichever way, uh, I'm hoping to see you all personally soon. So until then, God be with you. God bless you. Lift his face upon you, shine upon you, and give you his grace. Amen. And I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.